Good afternoon. You are the brave ones. You are the very brave ones. My name is Darrell Gunter. This is my colleague, Anthony Paganelli, who I've tried to rename Daniel, but his name is Anthony. And we're going to walk you through blockchain today. Um, before we get started, it would be helpful if everyone can introduce yourselves and if you can just tell us what would you like to gain out of our session today? Because we have 40 minutes together. What we've done is we've taken a five-hour workshop and put it into 40 minutes. <laughs> so why don't we start with... Uh, so I'm just curious, uh, in function of blockchain, we talk about rights and permission, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's part of it, yeah. That's part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, what it is, right, right, right. Beyond Bitcoin. Right? Beyond Bitcoin. Yes, sir. Uh, Robert Spain Campion. Hey, Robert. Uh, from Point of Art University in graphic construction. I'm just looking for Okay, excellent, excellent. Excellent. Kathleen Spray at Linfield College in Oregon. Lots more info. All right. Hi, my name is Emily McCutcheon. I uh, work at the Law Library at the University of Tennessee, where I'm also an information science student. Blockchain is something they tell us a lot about in information science education, but I have no idea what it is. And okay. Come on in. Come on in. Thank you. Eric Hartman, and Director of Electronic Resources at Texas A&M, and looking for an introduction. Okay. TD. Teresa Dice, Wiley, um, just trying to learn more about quality. Excellent, excellent. Yes, sir. Uh, we will, from McGill University in Montreal, uh -huh. trying to find out what will be the impact on the use use point of view with this new technology, which that will happen to our access, non access. Or... Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Liz Kosovo Widener, Virginia Military Institute, research and instruction, and I'm curious about. Um, information, security, and access. Oh, right. Mr. Watkinson. Everything that everybody else has said, that's an extra touch. Excellent, excellent. I'm Joe Crawley from Connecticut College. I've done a lot of personal research in, in, in cryptocurrencies. I finally got my head wrapped around how that works. Okay. I'm curious about how technology could be used in other contexts throughout my career. Excellent. Michelle Brewer, librarian. Walter's Clore. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know the basics. Gotcha. Gotcha. The man with cool hat. Appreciate it. Uh, Michael Meth, um, Associate Dean for Research and Learning Services and Parks in the West. And uh, I'm actually a book being printed right now on blockchain and methods. So I'm really interested to see what you're doing. Right? Mm -hmm. so, so, you mean, you? No, I don't want to. Come is, on up. No, because the reality is we all don't know. Exactly. That's, that's why I want to hear what you guys have talked about. And, yeah. I want to see what community you have performing here. I have to see where it's well taken. You'll be the same answer. And you are? I'm Angie Mays. I'm the director of, con oh, sorry, the Sakento, uh, director of collections at the University of Kentucky Libraries. And I'm also the co-chair, co I can't talk, co-chair of our research data services committee. And I know about blockchain technologies from my business background and the banking context, and I'm interested in cybersecurity and data protections and finding a way to strike a balance between the distributed pieces of data uh -huh. that are distributed out and corralling that in an efficient fashion, because we all know nobody is overstuffed. That's right. That is correct. Well, you know, we really hope to provide you with a good basic framework of blockchain. This uh, presentation has been delivered at the SAMA conference in, in Orlando to two groups, 20. Uh, AIP was my first uh, guinea pig uh, that we, we, we did the session with, and um, they came away with a couple of ideas that would help them in their publishing house for an idea for, for, for blockchain. Okay, let's get started. So this is our this is our agenda for today. We're going to give you some information on technology and history, talk about blockchain and five W's and next steps, and, and the summation. But feel free to interrupt us. Feel free to interrupt us and ask us questions. We're going to try to move this along because we really want to get those questions that are in your head out of your mind. 
out of, out, get those questions that are in your head, out of your head, and out, so you'll feel satisfied. How many of you use an Excel spreadsheet? How many of you send that Excel spreadsheet to someone? Voila, blockchain. Blockchain is what I like to call a very highly sophisticated Excel spreadsheet that provides you with information and transparency. It's based upon the rules of if this, then that. So, a little bit, how many of you are familiar with this book, Innovation and Its, and its Enemies? Okay. It's very good. In this book, Professor Callisus Juma's 2016 book, Innovation and Its Enemies, Why People Resist New Technology, he covers nine examples of how technologies that face opposition for a variety of reasons, electricity, mechanical refrigeration, music recorded sound, transgenic crops, and aqua advantage salmon. Imagine people actually being against street lights. Now, I'm, I'm going to test my friend's memory here. In 2001 at the PSB conference, <coughs> they had a panel debating whether books were going to be digital or not. I was at Elsevier at the time. I was senior vice president for the Americas. I went to the director of PSB and said, me and all of my team will not be back at this conference ever because this session will delay publishers in doing what they need to do because they want to push back on new technology. And we have seen that over the years that a lot of publishers are just now really digitizing their content. So imagine what, how that has held science back. How many of you know Bloomberg? All right. What about Tellery? How many know a company called Tellery? You're the first one in all these sessions I've done that know about Tellery. Before Bloomberg, there was Tellery. Uh, no, Tellery was the uh, fixed income foreign exchange uh, tool that was used on Wall Street. The reason why Dow Jones had to sell its company because they paid two billion for Tellery and then had to sell it for a negative 500 million to get off its books. That's why the Bancroft family said it's time to, to move out of that investment. The problem was that Bloomberg, I saw the first Bloomberg terminal, 1985 in Los Angeles as an account manager. I wrote a call report and I had to send it over a system called the Wayne system. I said, hey, I just saw this, this, this thing called the Bloomberg. It's so much better than Tellery. The VP of Tellery said to my manager, who's this young kid? You need to fire him. But Dow Jones proceeded to go to purchase the company, but because they stuck their heads in the ground, that technology uh, was beat by Bloomberg tremendously. Uh, we all know the Netflix story, how Blockbuster, now, of course, HBO, which is now owned by AT&T. Recently, the AT&T executive said, well, you know, uh, yeah, Netflix, they're they, they really don't have a brand, and I guarantee you, we'll see how AT&T is going to work out with that. Uh, we've seen how Sears uh, completely missed the boat with Amazon. Sears had the wish book. Everybody remember the Christmas wish book, right? Yeah, right. You know, you always look through it. Hopefully, you get one or two items out of it. <coughs> but no, but they lost because of that. So when you think about blockchain, I was at a conference. I wrote an opinion piece of research information. Uh, about the, this industry really needs to be more proactive, be more innovative. That piece that I wrote was a block, it was a block piece that wasn't produced, that wasn't published by a particular blog because they thought I was too negative on the industry. But Research Information uh, did publish it in August. It talks about how we as industry leaders really need to embrace new technology, understand it before we dismiss it. What we'd like to do now is to show you a, a, a quick video about platform economics. Technology, it's like the printing press, the postal service, the telephone and the internet have enabled collaboration across borders, connecting people like never before. Unfortunately,
current methods of collaboration and scientific research are centralized, where tremendous amounts of brain power, time, and money are wasted when siloed ivory towers attack the same problems at the same time, and hobbyists and non-accredited contributors cannot participate. And many of history's best engineers and scientists have been overshadowed by those who are most popular. We all know about Watson and Crick's discovery of DNA, but how many of us know about Rosalind Franklin's critical contribution? Now, thanks to VR and the blockchain, we can accelerate the rate of innovation. The Matrix. The Matrix is the newest evolution in collaboration. It's a library, a marketplace, and a bounty system for unique problems and for their creative solutions. On Matrix, anyone can solve the world's biggest and the world's smallest problems. The most challenging problems in math, science, engineering, cryptography, massive virtual worlds, and even art can all be tackled on a single platform, open to everyone. On the Matrix platform, anyone who holds an MTX token can place a bounty on a problem that they want the community to collaborate on solving. Creators compete to solve these problems by creating, sharing, and collaborating with one another. Matrix tracks these remixes and collaborations on-chain, so when the problems are solved, all participants in the solution are fairly credited and rewarded, not just the final contributor. Whether you're a PhD or an amateur enthusiast, anyone can access and contribute to an ever-expanding collection of problems across all fields. The Matrix Marketplace also enables direct value exchange between users, allowing anyone to buy and sell digital assets for use in their designs, research, or even virtual worlds. The history of innovation points towards a clear future, a world in which science, research, and collaboration occur on the blockchain. The Matrix is that future, and we invite you to be a part of it. Join us at matrix.ai to find out how you can participate in the future of innovation. So what are your immediate thoughts when you see this video on Matrix? A little bit like a folded game, a crowdsourced problem solving. And apparently with a built in earnings mechanism. Mm -hmm. What other thoughts when you think about how this would apply in, in the library setting? Uh, it is for instruction, online education. Mm -hmm. But problem working, hands on problem working. I think about authorship and what that means in terms of recognizing um, collaboration right. Right. across. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you think about um, on your college campuses, I believe you have some situations where you'll have the academic entity, you'll have a government entity, and you'll have a corporate entity. And so how do you actually manage those relationships especially when you're talking about technology transfer and the sharing of that, make sure that people get proper ideas for that. Okay. So, of course, everyone knows about blockchain, cryptocurrency. Um, and so when you think about the original blockchain, it's a growing list of records called blocks which are linked using crypto cryptography. Blockchains which are readable by the public or widely used by cryptocurrencies. Private blockchains have been proposed for business use. Some marketing of blockchains have been called snake oil. That was Warren Buffett who said that. Each block contains what they call a cryptographic hash of the previous block, which is a timestamp and a transaction date represented as a block. And then it, as you add each of these blocks, this becomes what they call a, a, a Merkle tree right here. And so traditionally, there's a group of people who are independent on this dist distributed ledger that are called miners. These are people from around the world who are part of this group who will then verify that each hash is correct. So let's say if Anthony, and he's a really good guy, but my, my co presenter let's say if he was a bad actor and he saw that there was a hash of information that he wanted to put some false information into mm -hmm. that. What would happen is that once he hits his return, it will go out to the other miners and they will go, but this isn't correct because it's not following the, the proper protocol. And so they would disavow that particular hash and then Anthony would be put into the, uh, the sandbox. 
Uh, no, jail box. I guess not the same box for them. Yes. Who are these miners, and what is their motivation for verifying this information? So traditionally, and we're going to get into the history because blockchain started in 2008 by a person or a group of people called Santoshi Nakamoto. And uh, basically what they wanted to do, they wanted to create a, a distributed ledger where they could share currencies, but nobody would own the whole ledger. It would be, the ledger would be shared all over the world. And they were rewarded with, they, had, they actually had a puzzle to figure out before they were awarded the token. So they wanted to make sure that they were a legit computer scientist who understood that. And there's a white paper, and this, this presentation, we'll make sure that you get it, because there's a lot of good links in there, along with the white paper that was written by them. So these are independent people who would communicate independently. But in another application, like say there's a cryptocurrency or you're exchanging anything, like who are going to be these, who, who what's the, that's a credibility very good point. of these miners so, to validate the data. Right. But originally, the original blockchain with these independent miners. Now keep in mind that technology, as it's introduced, it grows, right? Remember when we first uh, got onto the internet, we just had the URL. Now we're doing things with our cell phones, which is just un unimaginable. And what we're seeing is that blockchain is evolving. For example, Chase Bank. Chase Bank has actually created their own private blockchain. So it doesn't have to be these independent folks. You could actually create a blockchain of okay, people. Okay, so there's not the random miner on the Chase blockchain. Exactly. Oh, that makes more sense. That's right. That's right. That's right. Any questions about what is blockchain? So you think about it. Each each hash has information in it, and then the next person comes in and adds information, and then it builds this Merkle tree of information. So when we think about you know what is blockchain, of course it's a traditionally it's a decentralized ledger of the of these hashes, and now we're seeing that State Farm. You want to see some examples where State Farm is using blockchain for their claims adjustment as well. So basically it's authenticated in its date and time stamp. I'll give you a real example when we sold our house a couple of years ago in South Orange to move to Philadelphia. Um, the seller's lawyer took three weeks to get their initial deposit to my lawyer. She had every excuse in the world. Well, if we were on a blockchain, once we signed the agreements, and those agreements were signed digitally, that said that okay, now that it's been signed, now the money has to be released and it would have been wired to our lawyer's account automatically. Blockchain provides efficiency and it provides transparency. There's no more hiding behind, oh, I, I emailed it to you, or oh, it's somewhere in a text message. It's either you did or you, or you didn't do it. So when you think about when did blockchain start, you already talked about that, that was 2008, there was that white paper that we talked about, and then you think about, this was on the cover of Time, the man of the year, Satoshi Nakamoto, um, they don't know if it was one person, if it was, if it was a group of people who used that alias name, and you say, well, you know, where did it start? Exactly, what location? We don't know. It was all over the world. It was all of these miners were all over the world. Have, have any of you had the opportunity to read the white paper? Uh, if, if I get all of your cards, I'll make sure you, you get access to the white paper. But the links are in the presentation. So when you think about the blockchain possibilities, we have another video for you. Let's see if I can maneuver this as, as good as I did the last one. Can everybody see that okay? Eric, thank you very much for joining us and, and sharing the insights from your book. You're someone that has spent a lot of time looking at new technology and really trying to predict not only where it's going, what its impact could be, but also trying to think about the economics of it. You spent a lot of time studying digital platforms, thinking about you know the trade-offs that, that come up when you try to match demand and supply online. Um, how do you think that technology can help solve some of the issues that digital platforms may run into? Blockchain technology in some ways is unique because 
up until now, almost all digital platforms have really had a centralized sponsor. There's been a company or a government that's been in charge of setting all the rules and organizing it. And I think part of the excitement and the promise of the blockchain technology is that this can be done in a much more distributed way with lots of people contributing. You know, when we went from centralized databases to the internet, there was a similar set of excitement. And it was, in retrospect, very well justified as we moved away from just having, say, AOL or IBM deciding all the rules of these uh, marketplaces towards having people being able to set up hubs and connect. Now, with blockchain technology, I think we have the potential to have platforms that are also have that kind of distributed nature, yet have lots and lots of people connect to them. And going back to this idea of moving from the core to the crowd, what are the implications from a business perspective? If I'm running a digital platform today, I should I be thinking about that transition and the issues that may arise as I try to, to make the move? When you have the core setting all the rules, the nice thing is that you, know, you can have standards, lots of efficiency, but you also tend to get locked into a particular point of view that can create a lack of innovation. And even more concerning, it can create monopoly profits, uh, rent seeking, and uh, lock out people with new kinds of ideas. With a more distributed platform, hopefully you can overcome some of those weaknesses while retaining the advantage of having an interoperable platform. It's a delicate balance, but if done right, you can get the best of both worlds. One of the technologies that you spent a lot of time trying to really unpack is AI. And AI requires massive amounts of data. Right. You think blockchain can, can help in that field in terms of licensing this data, managing it. Mm -hmm. Where do you see this going? I'm hopeful because we're at a stage right now where as machine learning progresses faster and faster, the real core input is data, is information. Some of the big companies, the Amazons, Apples, Facebooks, Microsoft, they have a lot of the data that other people would like to use, and that's been part of the reason they've been able to have such powerful machine learning systems. But there's a lot more data out there in the world. We all have data that could be useful for machine learning. Every business does, and there's a lot more that could be, is being created from the Internet of Things. One model is to have that all become centralized in a few of these big companies and have them develop the machine learning systems. Another model I think most of us would find more appealing is having them, the data distributed in a way that we can all have access to it, but still have the kinds of privacy protections that we care about. Can that be pulled off? Well, that's what the cryptographers are working on. That's what the blockchain promises to potentially be able to do. If we can pull off that trick of having people have access to massive amounts of data while preserving privacy and the integrity of the data, then we can rapidly speed up artificial intelligence, machine learning, have a lot more people contributing to it. You raise a really interesting dimension, which is IoT devices. They're becoming pervasive, and to some extent, there's privacy issues that arise. But where do you see the, the potential of IoT, especially once you intersect it with blockchain and maybe even with AI at the same time? To drive these machine learning systems, at least the current version of them, you just need a lot of data. And IoT promises to increase the amount of data we have access to, you know, not by 10x, but maybe 100 or 1,000 or a million x. And so that could lead to a lot more learning about how we solve our problems, everything from healthcare to more reliable machinery to more efficient routing of goods and services to the people who need them. But that has to be done in a way that we can you know, protect the rights of the people who have that data, maybe create new rights that we're working on right now, like the GDPR rules, and embed them in some kind of a distributed rule set to keep track of who has what rights and who has the ability to do what sorts of things with, with my medical data. Maybe I want my doctor to be able to do one thing and the insurance company to do another thing. The government, researchers, each may have different sets of rights. Keeping track of all that is kind of a nightmare, and it's not, I'm not sure that I would want any one centralized entity to have all that power, but if we could do it in a distributed way, then I think we can speed up innovation, speed up access to the data, speed up the machine learning as a consequence, while preserving the kinds of rights we'd like to have. Decentralization of decision making and of rights while still having access to massively powerful data sets is the goal. If you'd like to revisit any of the set... That was the course that uh, I had the opportunity to take at MIT to get my certificate in blockchain. It's a very good course. And if you want to donate six weeks of your life to it, it's very good. It's very good. Okay, and so when we think about Scarlet Publishing and Discussion and Developments, 
Uh, this paper from Digital Science is, is really an excellent paper. It talks about, you know, what are the current issues in dealing uh, in the scholarly publishing industry. Reproducibility, huge issue, peer review. Journals are inflexible and limited vehicles for communication. Giving people proper credit. Commercial interests in the standing. If someone was to engage in a new product or goods or service, what is the ROI? And so when we get to the potential opportunities, you know, you think about silo to share information. Notarization of all contributions are noted. Study designs could be registered. Research data is timestamped. So when we think about the current developments, there are several current developments uh, that are available. Um, these are all hyperlinked, and in the spirit of time, I'm not going to go through them right now because my, my colleague has to come up. But in, in this paper that you'll receive, you can link right out to them. But there's some great developments that are happening. These people are the innovators and the pioneers that are going to help to improve access to scholarly research. And so how is it being used? Asset, man asset management trade processing settlement, insurance claims, cross-border payments, smart property, and of course, IOT. When you think about smart contracts, basically a smart contract says, if this, then that, which means that if my real estate deal got slowed up, it, it, wasn't, it wouldn't be slowed up because of, of uh, a lawyer holding on to the, the deposit. So the rules are established with the smart contract, and then as those uh, agreements are being met, the next steps happen, and it happens automatically. Uh, blockchain music. This was part of my case study I did at MIT, where we talked about, you know, how do you pay a musician uh, for, for their music in, in a very good way? Well, real quickly, basically what this means that if I'm a talent scout, I could go to an artist on the street and say, hey, I like your song, let's get it up streaming today. And if the audience listens, then that artist would be provided tokens that they can use in other areas of people who accept those particular tokens. What that means is that if the music is good, the artist will be paid right away. And you know exactly who's listening to the music, you know exactly when that song is listened to. And it takes out the middleman, it takes out the ambiguity, and it gives it transparency. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague. So, um, Quick question. question. When you're saying the artist is paid right away, Okay. Is that getting paid from a bank or from a wallet? It's, it's a, a token. Wallet. A token. It's a token. So that's all that's getting paid. Exactly. And you can, how do you you can exchange. Tokens? Okay, so Chase Bank actually is accepting tokens, mm -hmm. and they're converted it in, into what they call fiat capital, regular, you know, regular cash. Because somebody's got to have the money. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But that that token has an established value, and when we and when we think about uh, peer review. It, it, it really talks about how do you reward reviewers uh, for reviewing papers. A, a more particular question, when you say the token has value, is it like an established value or does the value change depending on whether or not the artist is more popular or less popular? Do, okay. do you as the person paying the token get to choose how much you want to pay them? So, as you know, the more people listen to a particular song, the more value it has. Right. So that person would get a, a value that has to be established with the token. Okay. Okay, yeah, so kind of feel on what you're saying here. Uh, recently, this year exactly, we passed the Music Modernization Act. And uh, I used to work in Nashville for a music publisher, so I understand from the songwriters, point of view, you have to sign with the publisher, and the contract should be 50-50, because that publisher is going to take 50% of that money. Then this artist has to go and get this pitch it to the record company, and then there's more people in this musician's hands in their pockets. So this Music Modernization Act is trying to kind of help out with all the streaming media situations. So one of the requirements is that a nonprofit organization, the mechanical license collector, has to create a database. Now, I'm not saying they don't necessarily use uh, blockchain technology, but it's kind of a good example of how this is working because anytime, because all those librarians always have that one faculty member or someone says, can I use some song in my class? You know, we all have them. And so this is a quick way that you can find out 
uh, who, who actually owns the music and how much it's going to cost to license it. All that information is there. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just listening. Oh, okay. So this, yeah, so this is a way that I think that us as librarians might be able to utilize this because we will have to deal with copyrights. And this is a good way to deal with our digital management, rights management system. Oh, okay. I'll let you win. <laughs> so what we're going to look at government-wise is because this is new. And we do know what happened a couple of years ago with, uh, uh, you know, the blockchain and the bitcoins, right? You know, all of a sudden they get this strong peak, and somebody's like saying, "I'm a billionaire." And the government's not too happy about that. We got to know how to regulate it. So the government's taking interest in the blockchain uh, technology, and they're doing so. It, it, like this says, I uh, have recognized the technology's potential for the delivery of public services in various stages of implementation. So what they're looking at is more is what we were talking about, the smart contract. So what we have here currently in the House of Representatives are looking at the best ways to handle blockchain technology. So they're trying to formulate some kind of guidelines and standards. Um, we have some states that are actually recognizing it and implementing it. Why would governments want to implement blockchain technology? Tax it. Not necessarily to tax it, but just like you know, Daryl was saying, you know, I had to wait on all this property to get exchanged. We have some like in Delaware where they're saying, okay, if you're going, we'll use it as a governmental uh, entity. In other words, if I'm going to get a title on a house, then why do I have to bother with insurance, title insurance, all this other stuff? Because uh, basically, it's all secure. It's you know safe. In other words, when I exchange my title over to you, there's no problems. Issues. So what does that do? It's efficient and it's cost effective. I no longer have to have uh, our attorney do uh, title insurance. I don't have to have that clerk sitting in the office you know, going through all this paperwork, right? So that's why Delaware is looking at this in Arizona and Illinois. Uh, Tennessee is recognizing their smart contracts as legal, valid, and enforceable. Because they know that they're using this technology out there, so we have to make sure it's regulated because the truth and reality is these kind of smart contracts will end up in the court system somehow, some way. I guess a good analogy that some of this research uh, described blockchain is a vending machine. That vending machine is coded to say, in order for you to get this Coke, you have to pay a dollar, two dollars, let's say two dollars. So when you, the purchaser, go and put that two dollars in there, you are agreeing to get this Coke for two dollars. So where does it get complicated is you get that Coke and the transaction should be done, right? It's coded and everything, everyone should be happy. So here's where the legal problem comes in is when you get that Coke and it's just not quite what you thought. So now you got a chance to start arguing. So that's where it gets a little bit more complicated. So that's why I think our government is really trying to look at this and how we're going to deal with this, especially in the court system. Because in law, you know, code is law, right? Now they're going to start saying law is code. Because now we're starting to use all these codes to make these contracts. So that's why even California, New York, all of them are looking at it. And we have to remember, this is done within the past year or so. This is so these are just a few states actually getting started. I'm sure we'll see more later on. And this is why it's efficient, cost-effective transparency to be utilized between other government agencies. And this is one thing I think as librarians we need to kind of consider as well, because we are accountable for all our spending and everything else, right? We have to send the federal government our reports, state our reports. We may be using this type of system, so that's why it's more transparent. <coughs> So how does it trickle down to you librarians, uh, you know, especially our academic librarians? Uh, so currently there are ideas, I know Georgia Tech is uh, looking at using blockchain for their transcripts. So in other words, I, I'm a student A and I graduate and I go to apply for a job and they say I need transcripts. What does that student have to do? They have to go contact the transcript in the you know, office, pay some money, get that official transcript mailed or whatever. 
This would avoid all that. It would go straight to that employer because we know it's secure and safe and it's anchored. So that's changing that. Uh, and they're also using it as academic badges. It's a way to help students kind of track their progress. You know, let's say student B, you know, uh, got through their uh, general education courses. We'll give them a badge. So they'll get a digital badge. Uh, just talk about how we can do the uh, uh, transcripts. And also our universities maybe will have to deal with it externally, right? We do a lot of contract work. Librarians, right? We'll have to work with vendors, things like that. This may be a, a possible uh, system we'll use. And we saw the matrix too, right? You know, we have a problem if we go to the system and we can research and work together. And everyone gets credit for it, right? And this stuff is just ready to go once it's done. So, libraries and blockchain. Now, I put in bold, look for decentralization and transparency opportunities, because blockchain is not to solve all problems, right? It just, we can't just rush to the technology and start trying to put it everywhere. So the main concept of blockchain is to decentralize and make things transparent, right? So those are the things and opportunities that we want to look for as librarians. Uh, so for instance, there's an uh, example that Google Graphic Metadata you know, everyone can come together and say, okay, you know, uh, the encyclopedia of science or whatever. We agree that all of this bibliographical metadata is what we need, and everyone accepts it. Uh, open educational resources uh, from authors directly to faculty. So in other words, like we were talking about, all the, yes, go ahead. Uh, finish your thought. No, I mean, I was just like if we were taking all this idea of where we all do the research paper together, and then it can go right to the faculty, and maybe they can implement it as well. So, I'm spinning my head here about what this might mean in terms of licensing and the ability to uh, share license terms across institutions when there are currently existing, you know, non disclosure agreements for some uh, providers. Um, and how this maybe would flip that on its head or not. Yep. That's your... a good point. I mean, you might want to elaborate on that. I, I think it's being more secure. We're, I mean, we're being more transparent. You know what you're writing. Like you're getting this from this person. You know what it is. And if you agree it to the terms. So, so, so I guess where, where my difficulty is right now is I don't know if I have a fundamental misunderstanding of transparency, does that mean transparency to all or just transparency between the two parties who are involved in the mm -hmm. transaction? Well, absolutely, it would be between you two, for sure, and anyone else that would agree to be a part of this blockchain. Yeah, go ahead. Part of it is that, so it depends on the setup of the blockchain, that's part of it. But what happens is when you create a block in the blockchain, you're creating data, and the data can be clear. Uh, one thing that happens is the way that the data is transacted is you sign onto the blockchain with what is your private key that creates a public key which cannot be tracked back, but that signs it. So if you see, for yeah, I'm called out. Thank you. Let me feel that. Sign me at the conference and make <laughs> So if, if Anthony, for example, signs on, then he can authenticate into the system. Because he's authenticated in the system, he can see the rights that he has in the faculty. A student would sign on would have a different set of rights possibly. And so when the two of them transact, or if you're transacting with an external agency, as long as you're on the same blockchain, because they have multiple ones in the blockchain, so as long as you're on the same blockchain, because of the authentication, it gives you rights to what you can do. And what there are. Yeah, so my right, guys are working with that way. Um, what you can do is because you can, depending on the blockchain again, you can embed smart contracts. And smart co contracts are these very small bits of code that run on this if this, then that mm -hmm. logic. So you can embed a code that says if Anthony, yeah. um, if Anthony does something, then this other action can happen, or he can have access to it. What's great about it is you can track all of the information in the blockchain, which is really a giant ledger. It's almost like a giant Google Doc that everybody mm -hmm. updates together. Um, and so you can actually also in the future change rights. So you can say today, at the point of this transaction, we have the rights, but tomorrow when our contract has expired and the rights change, 
he no longer has access, so I don't know. I don't know how many access mm -hmm. Does that help a little bit? Yeah. And that's part of the sort of the power of the blockchain is that it's time stamped and it's an immutable record. So once it's in, it's in. You can go back to the moment in time and you can verify what you have. But as things change going forward, you can update the contract and the contract will return what you have. You know, who's our catalogers in here? It's, it, like, the block is basically, it's like a bibliographic rec record in a sense. It's going to have a name, it's going to have a date, it's going to have the content, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, if the title is work, everything is going to be Maybe you look at it from a catalog or something. It's a whole lot of stuff to do. <laughs> sure. It is, it is. And it, it's going, I, I, I think the more we see it used, the more people we'll call it for. Does that make any sense? It kind of goes back to this whole analogy of new technology. And kind of what to add with that, though, I mean, this is what we're saying distributed, verifiable, sovereign idea. So, in other words, Mike, see? Now we're going to another change here, right? We verified, right? We're going to do that through this chain. And I think in this sense, and this this is kind of an interesting thing that if we can, as libraries, have this verifiable identity, and that can be exchanged through other campuses. You think about interlibrary loan. Right. So if you're a student and you're verified, you can get a book of materials from easily to another library because you would already have access. This is already being done in some institutions where uh, but actually public libraries are where you go. It's like they have a public library to and make it work in another city or another county. Because it's very that's the same system here. So it's almost like there's no one in here from interlibrary loan. I'm not saying you lose your job, but I'm just saying it'd be if I was a student and I needed something from Texas A and M, then I'd verify it in my school. Yeah. So I kind of like I just bypass it because I'm in a different institution. I'm not saying that this is possible, I'm saying this is theory, but this is a possibility that you can So I, I can tell that this is the end, so I'm sure we'll probably come to the end here. So, so it's not almost like a buffet of commands and pieces that are customized to based on the situation in general. That is correct. Would you say that it's a pretty amount? But just remember, as librarians, we just can't start applying this to everything in the library. We have to think about it as being what is centralized that we can decentralize. What needs to be transparent. Very secure. Yeah. It's encrypted. Very secure. Yes. Let me, let, let me say this. Um, no, no. I mean, keep in mind that people who are involved in cybersecurity, I did a, a panel for a law firm on cybersecurity back in 2014. In the room were CEOs of Fortune 500 companies who sat there aghast because they didn't realize that cybersecurity was such a big deal. There are always bad actors, unfortunately. And things are secure. And then, of course, somebody will crack it, and they'll make it more secure. Unfortunately, that's the world that I do that. My, it's funny, my brother, uh, he decided to come out of retirement to go do cybersecurity. He's, and I said to him, I said, yeah, because you're always going to have time, because it's always bad, bad actors, unfortunately. But it, it's extremely secure. Any questions? I mean, we stay here as long as you want. Yeah, you're right. Anthony and I are participating. We're publishing a book together along with uh, 18 other authors. We'll be out on IGI um, on blockchain AI and Google. And we're going to have we have 20 different experts writing about blockchain and AI. Let's say I find this great application for blockchain in my work. 
add. I've got a bunch of developers, and we just developed a blockchain app. Like, is it you have to buy blockchain components somewhere, or I have to buy into a bunch of miners or something? Like, can I just build one? You, you, yes. The answer is yes. You can build one, but keep in mind that the proficiency and the, the technology expertise uh, for this is, is quite significant. I've talked to. I've, I've been working with a particular publisher trying to find the right developer. When I talk to your chief IT guy about blockchain, I know more than they do. So like no scratch. So you got to be, be very mindful as to who you utilize. So you think only very big. Companies will be there's, there, there are some very small companies out there. I just recently met a gentleman. This company's like five people, and some of the work that they've done on blockchain is quite significant. So it's more about the expertise. It's the expertise. So if I can hire a couple of blockchain guys and gals, then I can build one myself. Yeah. So how do you recommend going about the starting degree of expertise? You hire consultants like me. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.